Coming up on today's Unscripted Faith, she grew up in a Muslim household when Jesus appeared to her in a dream and her life has never been the same. We'll find out how that dream transformed her life and how she's now helping others to defeat mental disorders. Angela, that's not all. We're going to hear from a man whose friends carried him through Europe for three weeks in a backpack. You heard it right in a backpack. You're not going to want to miss his incredible journey and how he's not allowing his disability to deter him. Talking to us also about the power of saying yes. All this and more on today's episode of Unscripted Faith. Phenomenal, it Jay. Yes. I am so excited to sit down and talk to two people with such incredible testimonies. Without a doubt, I mean, you're talking about some life-changing, transforming yes. stories that yes. we're going to hear about. Telling God yes, and you know what? It's just going to be an inspiring time. I can't wait to get in on it. I can't either. Both of our guests have said yes in scary situations, and we can't wait to hear their stories. So let's get to it and meet Kenza. Kenza, welcome to Unscripted Faith. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're so excited to have you, and we want to hop straight into it. So you're raised Muslim, and Jesus appears to you in a dream. Tell us about that. Yes, so I grew up in an Islamic household, and my understanding of life was that I was here for a certain amount of time, and during that period of time, I needed to earn salvation by works. See, I thought I could earn God's favor. I could earn a status, a good status with him. And so doing so by satisfying five pillars of Islam and all of that was works, works, works. It like fasting 30 days out of the year, praying five times a day. And Jay and Angela, by the age of, I would say by early twenties, I was feeling depressed. I was feeling anxious because I would miss prayer time. And I would have this cloud of shame and it's it's so we're not meant to carry all of that on our shoulders and so by the age of 23 i was convinced that the god of my understanding hated me because i would try to meet his quote-unquote standards and he would just raise the bar even higher because the god of islam is more so a spiritual pharaoh than you know our god yahweh and so i just uh, I remember just crying out to whoever was willing to hear me. I said, I know that you hate me. I just show me the way to you. Just have mercy on me. And I started just confessing every sin I could think of just so that I could feel some kind of favor with him. And within a short amount of time, I remember one night I went to bed and I had this dream. It was incredible. I had a dream that it was the end times. And in my dream, I looked out of the window and I saw the sky open. And as I looked out, I saw heaven open and a man in a white robe descending from heaven. And that man was Jesus. Now, for the first time in my life, I felt this peace as I looked at him. I felt this peace that made no sense to me because anxiety was my norm. This peace overtook me and I knew some, there was something about this man that was special. He was more than just a prophet that I was taught about in Islam. And so I'm like, okay, uh, now I wish I could tell you I woke up and gave my life to Jesus and everything was great, but that wasn't the case. It took about eight to 10 months for me to give my life to Jesus. And here's why. Is leaving Islam, especially for a woman, leaving Islam, period, is a big deal. It's not celebrated. It's it's seen as me being a traitor, even in the United States. I mean, there are honor killings even in the United States. The latest case being in 2021, and you, anybody can look it up, where the man just got sentenced for killing his daughters for for uh, being Americanized. And so I understood that leaving Islam had its own repercussions, and I needed to understand. Can I trust this God that I'm about to leave my whole family, everything I had ever known for, or could I not trust him? And I came to a crossroads and I decided to just move 
to South Carolina. I left Virginia. I had nothing, no one, but the call of God on my life and the Lord had blessed it. And now I didn't, I still didn't know how to get saved. And that's one thing that I, I would love for anyone who's listening today. They'll never think that somebody, just because we live in the United States of America or wherever you live, that people who did not grow up in the church know how to get saved. I didn't know how to get saved. I thought I needed to mm-hmm. take tests and quizzes to get saved. Mm-hmm. It was it, it was incredible. I, so I got saved in a parking lot. I called a friend of mine who I knew was a Christian. Um, and I said, hey, I had a dream about Jesus. And um, I, I don't know what this means. I don't know what my next step is. The only experience I had of church was watching Home Alone 2. And so, uh, I don't, uh, <laughs> because, you know, as a Muslim, you're very sheltered. I was like, so what is the next step? And my friend literally, he just said, listen, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you're saved. And he asked me, he said, do you believe that Jesus died, was crucified and died for your sins. And I said, I do. And he said, do you believe that he rose from the dead? And I said, I do. And he said, do you receive him as your Lord and Savior? And he, I said, I do. And he said, you're saved. He said, wow. you know, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord is saved. And so that's what, how I started my journey. Now, obviously, it didn't come without trouble and persecution. Jesus even says in this life, you're going to have tr- troubles and tribulations. So my family came after me afterwards and and they persecuted me after i met my husband and we had our children and and uh, the lord had continued to bless me in 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 spite of of all of that persecution and so he continued to grow my faith and so the lord called me into the field of counseling within a, a couple of months of me giving my life to jesus and you know what's interesting I started noticing when I, after I finished my clinicals and everything, that brothers and sisters in the faith literally struggle with the same issues that I struggled with as a non-believer. And that's because as I, as I started treating them from a pastoral counseling perspective, that's because we don't spend enough time understanding the truth of the gospel. We don't spend enough time reading the word of God so that we understand, we can distinguish falsehood from the truth of who God says we are. And so well, that's you know, Kent, I, got a qu- I got a question for you. That's an outstanding story. I mean, to see you now God convert you from the Islamic faith now to living Christianity. Now you're involved in the mental health field, which I have a background in. I think it's outstanding. But there's something I want to ask you about. People that are now saved, because you mentioned some of the people that are unsaved battle with the same things that people that are saved. How do you distinguish between spiritual warfare and mental health? So that's a, that's a really good question. So as believers, we are going to be attacked, right? We are. That's, a lot of people ask me, uh, will I ever get into a point in time where I'm going to stop getting attacked? I say no. No, because we're at a war where we haven't been called to a playground. And so I do believe that mental health at times, there are times when it's a, when we're experiencing a chemical imbalance. And so I've been asked, do I believe in medication? I absolutely do. There are times when people do need to take medication in order, you know, in, in times when there's a hormonal imbalance and look, I'm very transparent. I, I went through a period where I experienced postpartum anxiety and I was told by well-meaning Christians, you need to read your Bible more. And I said, listen, I diagnosed postpartum depression and anxiety. This is not a matter of not reading my Bible. This is a matter of a hormonal imbalance. So there are times when it's not a spiritual warfare issue. It's a hormonal imbalance or a chemical imbalance. And, and you know what? The Lord invented science and we can use science to our advantage. Now, there are also times when it's a spiritual warfare issue. So I, the questions I ask some of my patients who are even believers, and to answer your question, is have you been involved in the occult? Do you check wow. your horoscope before yep. you check your devotional yep. in the morning? Right. Do you... Do you spend time with the Lord? Who do you go to for wisdom? I've had people, Jay, 
who go who come see me on a Monday and go see a medium on a Wednesday. Wow. That's you're going to be attacked if that's your life. And so they don't understand that that's not biblical. And and so I've had to explain that to them. And so I've tied, there are the top three mental health disorders in the United States. It's anxiety, depression, and sometimes mood fluctuations. And those three can be tied to spiritual warfare as well. Kent, in just the few moments that we have, uh, one question for you. I know that you mentioned that your family came after you, okay? And I just have to get to this. Why in why do we see that within the Muslim tradition um, that if they leave the faith, family members come after them? What is the rooting of that belief? So the Quran and, and Islam puts the burden on the parents that if a child leaves the faith, then their eternity is at stake. So they need to do everything in their power. It gives them prescriptive measures in the Quran that they need to restore that child. When I say child, I don't mean an, a minor. I mean anybody they have birthed. Hey. They need to restore them back into the faith. So the first time they need to do it amicably. If the, if the child does not want to come back to the faith, then they need to use force up to death in order for them to satisfy their God, but, Allah. But, but Kenza, wouldn't that mean though, if they kill them, how would that, I mean, what, what does that do for the child then? I mean, that doesn't give them an opportunity to come back to the faith. Do they need to like re-engage the faith or does killing them seal their sal quote unquote salvation in the Islamic faith? So no, it's not about the child at that point. It's about honor. It's about, at that point, they look at it as, do you love your child more than you love Allah? Or do you love Allah more wow. than you love your child? That's how they see it. So basically and send so your child how, to hell. Wow. Kill oh, yeah, your yeah, child, yeah, yeah. send them to oh, hell. That proves your, wow, wow. that's crazy. Oh, that's absolutely. Crazy. Yes. Are you willing to sacrifice your child on behalf of Allah? Or do you love your child more than Allah? Because if you're not willing to do what Allah says, then you're not, your allegiance is not to him. Wow. Absolutely. Kenza, your testimony is so powerful, and I love these stories of Muslims seeing Jesus appear to them and what you were willing to lay down, knowing this could cost you your life, truly, for the sake of Jesus is beautiful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story, and thank you for your big yes to Jesus so all of us can benefit. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Yes. Well, you know, I think we need to have her back to talk some more. But listen, we have a man coming up who carried, who was carried across Europe in the most unusual way. You're going to hear about his incredible journey that's filled with faith, friendship, and perseverance when we return on Unscripted Faith. Make Cornerstone Network your home for the best in local Christian TV, bringing you programs like... Because God is holy and sin is opposite holiness. Our world here today is full of sin and because of that Jesus Christ came to make a way for us to avoid the punishment of God. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. Welcome home. Have you ever thought about how amazing the human body is? King David sure did. He reflects and says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David knew his creator and that his body was a masterpiece. Well, so is yours. Discover the amazing details and the many miracles that have to take place in each step of the process of fetal development all the way to birth. Created in God's image, part one. This week on Origins. Our next guest was carried across Europe in a backpack by his friends for three weeks. Outstanding. Let's get right into it. Kevin, you have been wheelchair bound, but yet and still you've not allowed your, your uh, disability to deter your faith. And tell us why you decided, let's go on a journey for three weeks, throw me in a backpack, let's explore Europe. Yeah, um, well, it, it definitely uh, was not like it just, uh, a spur of the moment thing to go to Europe was it? It was a, a long uh, process of uh, spending time with friends over the years. And I, I grew up in a home that was very, um, uh, we had an open door policy and we also uh, had a lot of creativity going on in our house of uh, my sister has the, the same disease. And so both of us being in wheelchairs, uh, we just kind of looked at every day and said, well, 
what uh, what can we do and what do we want to do and how do we get to that and uh, and so growing up in that kind of environment um, as a as an adult I really invited my friends into that idea and um, the Lord really has put a lot of uh, people around me that have the same mindset that same creative spirit to uh, look beyond what the world would say is normal and expected uh, of someone in a wheelchair and and so uh, part of that was that I was part of a potluck group on uh, I think it was Monday nights it's been several years now but I think it was Monday nights and uh, a lot of the houses that we met at were not wheelchair accessible and so my friends got used to just picking me up and carrying me in leaving my wheelchair uh, in the car on the steps outside and that led to well what else could we do if you know if we don't need my wheelchair what can we do and um, so we came up with a a very rudimentary version of a, a backpack for me to be carried in and uh, explored the sewers in our, our hometown uh, in North Carolina where I grew up. And uh, from there, we kind of said, well, again, well, what else can we do? We survived that. What's the next step? And so in 2016, uh, well, in 2015, we decided that we, we wanted to go to Europe. And um, it was a place I'd always wanted to go, um, just like a lot of people, kind of that, you know, post-college, get your get your guys together and have a fun trip. Um, and I, and yeah, I remember, uh, you know, in seventh or eighth grade, sitting in class, daydreaming about going to England or Ireland. And, um, and so I realized, well, maybe, maybe now it is possible, something I hadn't considered as a, a reality, but because of all these other steps building up to it, um, I, I went back to these guys and said, well, what if we spent three weeks above ground in Europe? And um, and they said yes, and uh, and we, we started that process. So in 2016, we uh, got on a plane and left my wheelchair behind and, and uh, spent three weeks uh, with me in a backpack. They just took turns carrying me and we got to dance in the streets of Paris and hop over fences in the English countryside. And uh, we kind of culminated the whole trip with going to Ireland and climbing the, the island of Skellig Michael off the coast uh, where there's uh, an ancient monastery that we wanted to experience firsthand. I mean, that is incredible, Kevin. I, I just think about when we heard your story, I think about the friends who cut open the roof and lowered their friend for Jesus. And your friends are literally carrying you into these places where you've dreamed of going. But I have to back up for a moment. You said you explored the sewers? <laughs> we was, did. What was that about? How like, did you find that out? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, we, we grew up on Ninja Turtles and Batman and, you know, it just seemed like a, a good idea at the time. And um, it was uh, my friend Tom. Uh, it was his idea. And uh, to be fair, if you look us up online and, and look at our our videos or photos, when you see the most dangerous and precarious moments, I'm usually being carried by Tom. So he's kind of the instigator of, of our craziest ideas. And um, I just, I, I do remember we were in the car one day driving somewhere. I think he was recording some music. And um, so we were on our way to the studio and, and uh, I shared this idea of what if we did something without my wheelchair? And, and he said, well, we're not just going to sit around and play video games. Let's, let's do something crazy. How about we go into the sewers under, under our hometown? And he, of course, already knew how to get in and, and do all that and so um yeah that that's what we did one friday night in 2015. so kevin let me ask you this question as well how did you guys get a backpack was there something that uh uh some you had to get made was it something that was already out there on the market because if they carried you around i'm guessing what's your weight and how did they do that yeah so at the time i was about 65 pounds and okay. uh the um, highest rated uh, as far as weight limit for uh, a carrier was like 
148 pounds, I think. Um, so I was definitely over the limit. And we also knew that I had some extra support that I needed. My, I mean, I've, I've never walked before. So when you're walking, your head moves and your, your body just experiences weight shifts that, that mine wasn't used to. And so, uh, we worked with a company called Deuter. Um, they are, their U S branches based out of Colorado. They've been around for over a hundred years and, and making backpacks and, uh, also child carriers. And so we got a hold of them and said, Hey, we want to basically break all the rules uh, that you have for your carrier and, uh, make it work for us. And they worked with us, um, directly to, um, make that first one in my parents' kitchen. We kind of bought, we, we, we bought their carrier and then, uh, tore it up and put it back together for what we needed. And then after the trip, uh, we sent them what we had made and they made a factory version, which we now, uh, get to distribute to families all over the world. We have about, uh, 1200 families in 48 countries that use our backpack now. And we're actually on version 2.0 based on their feedback, which is really fun. That's incredible. And probably version 2.0, you're going to want to go hike the Himalayans. I mean, I don't know. This is incredible, <laughs> Kevin. Absolutely incredible. One last question in about the 30 seconds we have remaining. This is a massive story. Why a children's book? Mm. Uh, yeah, well, the, you know, I, I wrote the grown-up version, as we now call it, the, the memoir, uh, right when we got back from the trip in 2016. And uh, people have enjoyed that. And yet, uh, at some point, I kind of realized, well, the people actually in the backpack are mostly children. Um, I'd say probably 90 or 95 percent of our families, uh, the kids would be too young to read that book themselves. And so um, I, I felt like I wanted to be able to share my story in a way that those kids could um, process and enjoy it and see themselves in the book and say, oh, I, that guy's doing what I'm doing now. And um, so now we, we made this picture book to go in with every backpack that we give away. But as we we're writing the book and, and doing the illustrations, we realized it's just a great story of friendship that everyone needs. And so we made it available to the public. Well, Kevin, thank you so much uh, for your story, sharing your conversation with us here, and just your courage and willingness to keep, for, keep going forward in spite of any disability. You are definitely an inspiration to us all. Come, by any, come back any time here on Unscripted Faith. Thanks. Well, we return in just about 60 seconds. Find out why saying yes, no matter how scary the situation is, can make all the difference in your life. We'll be right back. When you give to Cornerstone Television this month, we'll send you Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World by Dr. Jeremiah. Filled with encouraging and inspiring words, Dr. Jeremiah helps you navigate the difficulties of daily life with faith, courage, and resilience. He shares practical insights and timeless wisdom from the Bible that will help you find hope comfort and strength even in the darkest of times this book includes biblical examples of hope that will inspire you during challenging seasons inspiring teachings on how to claim victory even in the hardest of times practical wisdom for holding god's promises in your heart whatever hardship you're facing encouraging words for a discouraging world will help you find perspective hope and a renewed sense of purpose request your copy today as our thank you gift when you give to ctvn to give call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate well, if you've been with us on this journey you heard two from familiar powerful stories that have just completely revolutionized the way that we think about telling god yes, yes. you know think about it kenza told God yes in the spite of losing family, being persecuted. And then you got Kevin that decides to hop in a backpack. I mean, custom made and goes on a journey. I mean, you know, everything that we go through, uh, if we tell God yes in our lives, he's going to use it to his honor and to his glory. Amen. So in your world, is there any area that seemed crazy up front that you told God yes, that it made sense later on? 
Yeah, I feel like that's been my collective story over and over, Pastor Jay. Like these continual crazy yeses that, you know, you forsake financial well-being for the yes to the call. You know, you give up what you feel like God is, you know, where you're going to go with your life to say yes to where God wants to take you. Um, but what I was so struck by with their two stories was that my yeses were never at the expense of I'm going to die. You know what yeah, I mean? Right, right. Like literally, Kenza, that was yeah. a very real reality. There are mm -hmm. honor killings. And even, even with um, Kevin, like his physical well-being, if his friends are not steady on their feet and he is put in a backpack, he is relying on Jesus to keep him secure. Yeah. How about you, Jay? Uh, you know, let me first springboard off of what you just shared there. I think also his friends had to say yes. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? I yes. think sometimes coming into your destiny, you need others 100%. that say yes with you. Yes. You know, and if you don't, and that's why I think sometimes sharing your vision, your dream, what God's put in your heart, you've got to have spiritual midwives yes. that can come alongside and birth that out. As a matter of fact, uh, you mentioned about giving up money and things like that. Yes. People don't realize the price that my wife and I paid to come to Pittsburgh. You know, we took a $50,000 a year pay cut. We just bought a six bedroom home. We had a phenomenal church. We traveled, did whatever it is that we wanted. We did anything. I mean, we had it made and God said, strip everything and move to Pittsburgh. We lived with my in-laws, her parents, and they gave us a bedroom and a half. Wow. Two be actually two bedrooms and nothing bad against them. I'm saying course. we gave all that up to come here. And in less than 10 years, yeah. seeing all that God has done. So it seemed crazy up front, yes. but you know what? When you tell God yes up front and you're excited about it and you know that God's called you, he'll always make it up to you on the backside oh, of it. Exceedingly above whatever you could give. He, he will never be out given. You know, I think about even you saying that, Pastor Jay, and you and Tiffany with this newest venture of yeah. this pregnancy center. Oh, that's another one. You're I mean, you're literally risk. Yeah. You have had yeah. death threats. Death threats. We get it all the time. We get, and we told God, yes, we signed uh, $2,500 monthly. We always do stuff with money. When God wants you to do, uh, telling me yes, yes, a lot of time you got to trust him with everything. Yes. And so we just went out, signed a $2,500 monthly lease, didn't have no money. And God has filled the bill every single month. Now we're thriving. My wife works there pretty much full time. I mean, it's just been outstanding to see what God has done. But if you, we never told God, yes, we wouldn't have seen ourselves on the platform of 10,000 people at Harrisburg. I mean, so many babies have been impacted. Another baby was just saved this past weekend. I mean, just outstanding all because we told God, yes. So yeah, that's our story. I got plenty more, but we ain't got yes. enough time. Truth. I mean, time. all of our yeses to Jesus require something from us. We Without can't give enough. an empty yes and expect all the king of glory to fill all the things, right? And he'll make it up to you. Always. That's the thing too. You have to understand that, that he'll always make it up to you. Always. The king will never take more from you than never. he plans on multiplying it back. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, 30, Come 60, on. 100 fold. You can go on and on and on. Yes. He has been so good to us. Even coming to Pittsburgh now, Man, we're, I'm sitting here with you because we told God yes. Yes. There are yeses all of us need to make and give to Jesus. When you give him your yes, no matter what it looks like it may cost you, he will give you exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Give him yes today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.